Hi everyone, so today we're setting off with the first of our three classical era composers, Haydn. Just as a reminder, our generalized classical period dates are 1750 to 1825. It's a pretty short period, you know, really just the lifespan of a human, but a lot happens within these 75 years. Here's a portrait of our handsome hero of the hour, Franz Joseph Haydn. He was born in 1732, so before the end of the Baroque period, and he dies in 1809, so before the end of the classical period. He really straddles this transitional era. Now, because he's the father of the classical period, he's often known as Papa Haydn. And I promise that's the last cartoon for this slide deck. Haydn was born in a little village called Rorau in Austria. And even today, this place just has a population of, you know, just over 1600. So very small village now, way smaller then. This is a photo out of outside of Haydn's birthplace. I think this sort of photo is kind of voyeuristic, frankly, uh, maybe a little bit creepy. But from what I understand, it's been turned into a museum uh, that has this giant bust of Haydn out front. It's critical in understanding Haydn that he didn't come from fame or wealth or anything like that. He's really a self-made man. And Haydn himself said that, and I quote, Young people can learn from my example that something can come from nothing. What I have become is the result of my hard efforts. Haydn's father was a wheelwright, which just means that he made and repaired wheels and his mom was a cook. His dad actually acted as a kind of village mayor for Rorau as well, but importantly, he was also an amateur musician. His parents valued music, and this can be seen in, not, in that not only Franz Joseph became a musician, but so did two of his brothers, Michael and Johann, as well. Well, in 1740, Franz Joseph gets noticed, and he's recruited to join the St. Stephen's Cathedral Choir in Vienna. This is where Haydn really starts to learn, uh, both from formal music lessons as well as through osmosis, just from being in this great musical city. Things start getting tough, though, because Haydn's getting older, and in those days, if you're a boy with a great voice, you were at risk of being turned into a castrato. In other words, one's testicles would be surgically removed before puberty so that their voice would not drop. Now, in case you're wondering, this is not practice anymore, as it's obviously unbelievably inhumane. Well, Haydn manages to avoid going under the knife by the skin of his teeth, but that means he's kicked out of the choir, and he starts to freelance in Vienna to make ends meet. This, again, is a rough time for him, as if all the previous times hadn't been. But he does meet this guy named Nicola Papera, who was this Italian composer who Haydn ended up regarding as his only real teacher. Now, if you're writing the grade 9 history exam, remember this name, Nicola Porpora. You don't really need to know anything else about the guy, but this will uh, hopefully fetch you some brownie points. But yeah, things are tough for Haydn during this period, and he's making ends meet doing really anything musical that comes his way. Teaching, performing, composing, just anything musical. But in the process of this, he starts gaining the attention of potential patrons. The RCM text states that in 1759, Haydn gets his first job as Kapellmeister with Count Ferdinand von Morsen. Weirdly enough, though, it's not actually entirely clear the date when Haydn takes this job. And frankly, it's not clear that it was Ferdinand von Morsen that he was working for. There's some question about whether it was indeed Ferdinand who hired Haydn or if it was uh, Karl Joseph Franz von Morsen instead. Either way, you know, it doesn't really matter Uh we have the rough idea of where he was at this period, and it's during this period that Haydn starts writing symphonies. 1760, we see Haydn get married to Maria Anna Keller, who is represented in this just unbelievably terrible portrait. portrait. Like, seriously, we've, we've seen such amazing art and music coming out of this era, and this is the best we've got of Maria Anna. So, to go along with this terrible portrait, there was a, apparently a really terrible marriage between Maria Anna and Haydn. They both had lovers outside of their marriage. Um, one major factor, one major contributing factor for a lot of the unhappiness seems to be, have been that Haydn had actually been in love with Maria Anna's sister Therese, but nevertheless had ended up marrying Maria Anna instead, which, you know, just not a great recipe for success. Count, whoever it is, uh, von Mortzen, ends up following upon bad financial times, and as a result, Haydn gets laid off from his job as Kapellmeister. Haydn lands on his feet, though, because 
he quickly gets pit snatched up by this guy named Prince Paul Anton, who's the head of the powerful Esterhazy family. In 1761, Haydn becomes assistant Kapellmeister and gets moved out to Eisenstadt, which was the seat of the Esterhazy's power. It's also worth taking note that in 1762, this began the time where Prince Nicholas began his patronage of Haydn, and that patronage would continue until 1790. So this is Eisenstadt where Haydn moved to work for the Esterhazys. In 1766, Haydn gets a promotion to Kapellmeister, so no longer he's just an assistant, and he moves with the Esterhazy family to the Esterhaza estate, which was this massive palace which was known as the Hungarian Versailles. Now, as part of his contract with the Esterhazys, Haydn had to follow this dress code, abide by certain manners, train musicians, conduct, compose, perform, so much stuff. He was in charge of music for the court opera house, the theater, and chapel. And really, he was in command of all the music for this massive, powerful family. But while all of this sounds great, Haydn felt like he was a bit of a bird in a gilded cage while living in Esterhaza. It was remote, it makes Haydn feel very isolated. He persists, however, and he's been given the freedom to explore whatever musical area which he wanted to. He, he ends up writing over 100 symphonies during his life and 68 string quartets. Having this artistic freedom allowed him to write in such unbelievably vast quantities. In 1790, Haydn gets to move back to Vienna after Prince Anton succeeds Prince Nikolai as the Esterhazy Big Kahuna. He's still employed by the Esterhazys, but because Prince Anton's just not that big into music in general, he, he keeps Haydn on his payroll, but the only thing he really requires of him to do is to write a mass once a year. Well, now Haydn has a bunch of time to finally do the things that he wanted to do, like travel. So in 1790, Haydn heads across the English Channel and makes his first trip to London, where he's been engaged by a concert promoter named Johann Peter Solomon, to give a bunch of concerts. And during this time, Haydn composed and leads the performances of the first of his six London symphonies. And from accounts from that time, we know that these performances went over just super well. In fact, Haydn is such a star that he gets an honorary doctorate from Oxford University. In 1792, we see Haydn go back to Vienna where he meets you know, this little guy named Beethoven. And Haydn takes him on as a student for a short time. So, who are the big three of the classical era? We've got Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, right? Mozart and Beethoven are both mentored by Haydn. So, he's very much rightly known as the Papa Smurf of the classical era. In 1794, we're back in London and we see Haydn's last six symphonies go over just massively well again. Then 1795, I realize we're flip-flopping back and forth between these two countries. We're back in Vienna. This guy is just absolutely all over the map. But this is his last big move, and from this point on, Haydn stays in Vienna until his death. As he gets older, he writes oratorios, uh, namely The Creation and The Seasons. It's not The Four Seasons, that's Valdi, The Seasons. It's an oratorio by Haydn. And we also see him composed six masses for Prince Nicholas II, who succeeded Anton. And Haydn wouldn't be Haydn if he didn't write a bunch more string quartets. In 1802, Haydn retires. As he's getting older and his health is getting worse. And his last public appearance is six years later in 1808, when he performs his oratorio, The Creation. On the 31st of May, 1809, Haydn dies, and at his memorial service, Mozart's Requiem is performed. As you may have been able to add up throughout this lecture, Haydn outlived Mozart on either end of Mozart's life, and really got to see the full evolution of the prodigy's career. So next time, we're going to start looking into Haydn's musical style and contributions. Thanks for listening.